This is Microsoft's brand new Windows Dev Kit 2023, AKA Project Volterra. It's part of Microsoft's big push into the ARM ecosystem, and I'm gonna tear this down and test it out. Earlier this year, I made a video about Windows on ARM. What's ARM? It's the tech that powers Apple's M1 and M2 chips. It's the tech behind the tiny Raspberry Pi that took the hobby and industrial computing world by storm. But what's Windows on ARM? Well, according to my last video, a lot of wasted potential. Microsoft wants to change that, and that's why they just launched this dev kit. Inside it, the fastest ARM processor that's certified to run Windows, plus 32 gigs of RAM and a 512 gig SSD, all for $599. You see, ARM processors, unlike x86 ones from Intel or AMD, are different. They have a simpler design, they're usually more power efficient for mobile use, and even with all that, Apple has proven ARM CPUs can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with fast Intel and AMD chips. And unlike Nvidia's latest graphics cards, you can get more performance using less power. For ARM laptops, that means all day battery life, no fans, and still high-end performance. But when I called Windows on ARM wasted potential, I got a lot of comments about how I didn't give it a fair shot. The CPU in the dot one I tested was the Snapdragon 7C. What I should have done, everyone said, was buy a Surface Pro, which has a much faster chip, the SQ2, based on the Snapdragon 8CX Gen 2. Well, you know what? Microsoft just one-upped themselves. This thing has an even faster chip. Inside is Qualcomm's latest ARM CPU, the Snapdragon 8CX Gen 3, and it's the fastest chip currently certified to run Windows on ARM. So I'm gonna retest everything on it. But first, let's take a quick peek at the hardware. It's kind of like a Mac mini, but plastic and not metal. Right out of the box though, I saw some weird features, like there's mini display port here instead of HDMI. It also has this weird 90 watt external power brick. And when I looked at the spec list, it seemed like they just grabbed the Surface hardware and jammed it into a desktop enclosure. The dev kit can run one display through mini display port and another two monitors through these two USB-C ports on the side. But only the mini display port is available at the initial system boot up. The USB-C ports only come up after Windows is started. And when I saw it had an ethernet port, I hoped that it'd be 2.5 gigs, but unfortunately it's just a gigabit. They don't even mention the port speed in the specs online. I was half expecting it to just be 100 megabits like the slower dot one that I tested earlier this year. Popping off the bottom cover, I can also see there's a 2230 NVMe SSD inside here, but that's funny because in the intro video, they showed off a 2280 size SSD. But there's no mounting point besides the 2230 standoff, so you'll have to improvise if you wanna use a longer SSD. The rest of the innards are a bit of a mess. It looks like they literally grabbed the main board from a surface and crammed it in, judging by all these empty board connectors. And it does have a fan, which is a little surprising. With this much volume, they could have probably gotten away with one big heatsink, but a fan's probably cheaper. And since they went with a plastic case, it'd be harder to get heat out without active cooling. I won't go any deeper into the teardown here though, since Microsoft already did that in their own video but it does look exactly like they slapped a Surface tablet motherboard in a box and popped on a fan and a few extra boards for IO. It's not very polished, but it is more upgradable than a Mac mini. Heck, it's more upgradable than my Mac studio that cost six times as much. The first boot took a while and I was worried because for some reason I couldn't get the mini display port output working no matter what. I tried my mini display port to DVI direct into my monitor, I tried two different mini display port to HDMI adapters that I know work, and I also tested it all on my old MacBook Air. I'm not sure why it wasn't working, but other people haven't had the same issue, so maybe I just got a dead port or something. But after I sorted that out and started setting up Windows, I noticed the setup wizard really wants you to log into a Microsoft account. Luckily, you can still create a local account with Windows 11 Pro, but it nags you the whole way through. After another reboot, I popped open Task Manager, and Microsoft's done a pretty good job getting almost every native app running on ARM64. There are only a couple stragglers that still run as x86 binaries. I tested Minecraft and Rocket League on the Dot .1 mini PC, and Minecraft was okay, but Rocket League was sluggish and even locked up and froze a few times. On the dev kit, since Rocket League is still x86 only, I wasn't expecting much, but it was way better than the Dot .1. It was totally playable. It was a little slow and I could only play at 720p, but the game didn't stutter much, and I was even able to score a goal this time. With the basics out of the way, I ran some benchmarks. First, I tested networking. I used iPerf3 to send as much traffic as possible over the network. The dev kit seems to use a USB to ethernet bridge, this Realtek chip here, and it works well enough. I got around 950 megabits down and a little bit less up. But I did notice coil whine when I was running download tests. Here's what it sounded like from about an inch away. 
It was almost silent when uploading, and in real world use, it came and went, but I did notice it a lot during installs and downloads, like when I was installing Rocket League. It's a little annoying, but I'm also a bit sensitive to things like coil wine. I also connected to my Wi-Fi 6 network. Windows reports the built-in Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi 6E capable of over a gigabit per second, but in the real world, that's a little more theoretical. On the dev kit, I got about 300 megabits down and 230 up. Not earth shattering, but it's about as fast as my MacBook Air in the same location, so that's not too bad. The next thing I wanted to test was a simple CPU benchmark, Geekbench. It's not comprehensive, but it does provide a good baseline for comparison and it runs native on ARM and x86. Well, the dev kit beats the pants off the dot one. It put out a score of about 1100 single core and 5700 multi-core. That's compared to 500 and 1500 on the dot one. But what a lot of people wanna know, especially since you're getting higher specs for hundred bucks less, is how this thing compares to the M1 Mac mini. And I hate to disappoint, but even though it's two years newer, it still falls short. The M1 is noticeably faster at about 1700 single core and 7700 multi-core. But Twitter user BendyCat dug even deeper into the rabbit hole and explored performance under x86 emulation. Thousands of Windows apps still run emulated until developers get dev kits and work on porting them to ARM. Microsoft has an x86 emulation layer built in, but BendyCat was also able to hack Apple's Rosetta 2 translation layer in and run Geekbench on it. And what did he find? Running Apple's Rosetta translation layer through Linux in a virtual machine was faster than running Windows built-in x86 emulation. That's kind of disappointing, but hopefully it'll just push Microsoft to improve their software going forward. In his results, he also got better performance running Debian Linux in a VM than running the benchmarks natively inside Windows. So yeah, a bit of progress still to be made. Through all my testing, thermals were good and you can't even hear the fan unless you put your ear right up to the unit. The top does get a little warm, but it's not uncomfortable. So the next big question I had is how is the dev kit's power efficiency? Since I don't have my Mac mini anymore, I asked around on Twitter and Twitter user Twitstan, who does have one still, reran Geekbench measuring power usage from the wall. The Mac mini uses about four watts at idle and during the Geekbench run peaks at around 28 watts. On the dev kit at idle, it ran about five watts and during the Geekbench run, it also peaked around 28 watts. If we take those numbers and calculate the Geekbench score per watt, you can see the M1 mini soundly beats the brand new dev kit and it's also more efficient the whole time it's doing it. Heck, even at idle, it's a little better. Qualcomm definitely has a ways to go for both performance and efficiency. But performance aside, wouldn't it be nice to have a standard ARM desktop platform for Linux? Yeah, it would. And unfortunately, this isn't it. At least not yet. Both Alex Ellis and Ben Wang tried getting Linux to boot. Neither of them could get past a major hurdle though. Neither Microsoft nor Qualcomm publish a device tree for the hardware, and because of that, Linux won't boot natively. Alex even published this blog post that gets into the details, and I'll leave a link to it below. But at the end of the day, to get Linux booting on this box, one of two things has to happen. Either someone will have to reverse engineer hardware support, like with Asahi Linux on the Mac, or Microsoft and Qualcomm have to team up and support it. One of those things might happen, but I wouldn't place an order for one of these things expecting it to happen. What you can do right now is boot ARM Linux using WSL, or the Windows subsystem for Linux. I did that, in fact, and after applying an extra update I had to download, I was able to run Ubuntu 22 inside Windows. And running Geekbench inside the VM, it still ran almost as fast as it ran native in Windows. And if you're willing to forego Linux entirely, you can actually native boot OpenBSD. Alex Ellis got that to work and demoed one of his Go projects running on it. But even with hardware support, the usefulness of the dev kit for some things like running it as a network router is a little diminished due to lackluster IO. But it's still an interesting box and I think it'd be a great option for an ARM Linux desktop if support is ever offered. It's a heck of a lot faster than any current ARM Linux SBC, but it's not quite in the territory of a water-cooled Ampere workstation if you're really gonna go balls to the wall. Microsoft announced this box as a developer tool, something developers can use to make sure their apps work with Windows on ARM. And that's a smart move because if they tried to introduce this as a Surface desktop or something along those lines, the press would absolutely tear it apart. The two-year-old M1 Mac mini still puts this to shame. It does cost less and it comes with more RAM, an upgradable SSD and triple monitor support. Those are things the M1 mini only wishes it could have, but it is still slower and by a pretty wide margin. And it also can't run Linux natively, at least not yet. The Mac isn't way better in that regard, but it does have Asahi Linux and that runs pretty well already. 
The build quality inside is a bit meh, but it does look nice and it's pretty unobtrusive. But my main takeaway is this whole effort hopefully indicates Microsoft is getting more serious about ARM. Hopefully. I'm still not sure. The experience with Windows is still not up to par, but I do like how they've made an effort here. It would be even better if they took a loss and sold these things for a lot less so more devs could pick them up, but with as much RAM and disk space that they toss in, it's not that bad a deal. If they want to go further and make this box a competitor to M1 or M2 class machines, they have a long way to go. And hopefully by then, either Qualcomm steps up their game, or some other ARM manufacturer can step in, because it can't feel good always being two to three years behind the competition. Or maybe ARM fumbles the ball, like with their current licensing disputes, and Risk v starts to see some uptake. Who knows? It probably won't happen quickly, but it's an exciting time for SOCs and CPUs right now, and it's anyone's guess what will be the dominant force by the year 2030. But it's pretty obvious Microsoft wants skin in the game if more people start flocking to ARM. And this dev kit is a step in the right direction. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.